welcome. I am Mario Rendon. I have the privilege of being the chair of the Redwood City San Mateo County Chamber of Commerce this year. And if we were live, we would be in a room full of 300 plus people enjoying a buffet breakfast. But we are live today in Chamber Studio here at, at the Redwood City Chamber offices. And so first, Thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to join us for this virtual progress seminar series. Uh, we hope that you find uh, the, the, the program that's been put together enjoyable. Um, second, a very big thank you to the progress seminar co-chairs. So Roseanne Faust from SAMCITA, Assemblymember Kevin Mullen, and Supervisor Carol Groom, who unfortunately could not join us today. And then we couldn't move forward without acknowledging all our sponsors who you have been watching the slides roll through. Uh, so we couldn't do this without their ongoing support and their patience and their just continued support of all the different chambers activities. A special shout out to uh, W.L. Butler Construction for being uh, this morning's session sponsor. And so uh, we are, as you can see, socially distanced. We do have our masks and um, go Giants, it's a little too late. but. With that, let me turn it over to uh, Progress on our co-chair and uh, CEO of SAMCITA, Roseanne Faust. We are doing the dance today because we all have our masks on and we're so grateful to the chamber, to all of you who are joining us for our first virtual progress seminar. And what I'd like to do is introduce some of our attendees, some of our esteemed elected officials. From San Mateo County, our mayors, our vice mayors, we have Mayor Warren Lieberman from Belmont, we have Vice Mayor Charles Stone from Belmont, we have Mayor Emily Beach from Burlingame, Vice Mayor Ann Keegren from Burlingame, Mayor Glenn Silvestri and Vice Mayor Jesslyn Manalo from Daly City. We have Mayor and Vice Mayor from Foster City, Catherine Mahanpour and Sanjay Gahani. We have Mayor Cecilia Taylor from Menlo Park. We have Mayor and Vice Mayor from our city of Millbrae, Ruben Holliber and Ann Schneider. We have our Mayor Pro Tem from the City of Pacifica, Sue Beckmeyer. We have Vice Mayor from Portola Valley, longtime progress attendee, Marianne Moisey Derwin. We have Mayor Diane Howard from our own hometown, Redwood City. We have Mayor and Vice Mayor from the City of San Carlos, our wonderful neighbors, Ron Collins and Laura Palmer Lowen. We have Mayor Joe Gothels from San Mateo. We also have Council Member Diane Pappen. We have Mayor Rich Garbarino from South San Francisco. And it is just wonderful to have you here today. It's gonna to be a great panel. We have three Fridays that are chock full of information. And now it is with great pleasure that I introduce my seminar co-chair and our assembly member pro tem, Kevin Mullen. Kevin? Thank you so much, Roseanne. And Roseanne, thank you so much for your leadership uh, in multiple capacities over the years. And uh, it has been uh, a, a highlight of my own career to be associated with the Progress Seminar uh, as a co-chair for a number of years now and to partner with Roseanne and the folks here at the Redwood City uh, San Mateo County Chamber of Commerce. So uh, what I need to do right now is I have the responsibility <clears throat> of introducing our keynote speaker. And I just want to make sure that we are able to uh, get her on the line. We may have to idle for just a minute or two while we wait to cue her up because I've got this incredible intro but it's not more than a minute, so I want to make sure that we are able to uh, get her. So if you will bear with us, um, pretend we're all together and this is an opportunity to get a cup of coffee or a Danish, uh, check on the kids, uh, and I will get a cue uh, when the Madam Treasurer of the State of California, Fiona Ma, uh, is with us. But uh, extraordinary, uh, extraordinary times that we find ourselves uh, right now. Uh, not only in this state, uh, but in this region and in this country, uh, I'm sure like all of you um, uh, are, are at this moment watching uh, CNN uh, with one eye and our Zoom call with your other eye to see what's happening uh, on the national level with our presidential uh, results. Uh, it appears, at least uh, 
you know, folks smarter than I at the national level, level are projecting that Joe Biden uh, will be the next president of the United States. But it's been an extraordinary uh, election cycle. And uh, we're going to have the opportunity to ask Fiona a little bit uh, about, you know, she'll certainly talk about the economic recovery and everything happening from a um, uh, economic standpoint, uh, from her vantage point as the treasurer of the state of California. But also, uh, she's an astute political observer, and I'm sure, uh, like me and uh, the other political nerds in the state, she's been watching uh, with real interest on what has happened and, and some interesting results as well on our state propositions. You know, California is a blue state, a progressive state, but it's also a little reminder, a number of the progressive propositions actually failed at the ballot. And uh, it's a reminder that California is a great big, uh, diverse, uh, both economically and politically uh, ent uh, entity. And uh, it, uh, it will be very interesting to see how California fares if, in fact, Joe Biden and, and Kamala Harris are uh, elected and it becomes official, sworn in uh, January 20th, what that will mean for the state of California. Uh, it appears as though Nancy Pelosi will still be the Speaker of the House of Representatives. And um, we will now have a person sitting in uh, the vice presidential suite uh, with deep ties to California. So I imagine that uh, is only, portends only good things for the state of California. But uh, it remains uh, uh, to be seen what's going to happen in the U.S. Senate, for example. Uh, that also will determine the fate of uh, some of our requests from the state of California. We're dealing with a $54 billion uh, state budget deficit, and I'm going to ask Fiona about that and sort of what some strategies are because we've gotten very little federal help uh, to this point uh, uh, since the pandemic started from a fiscal standpoint. So we're going to need, um, I was just slid a harvest menu. That, I thought that was gonna say Fiona Ma is on the line. We need a few minutes, so maybe oh, go over the- this is, uh, that's, that's a good idea. As you, as you can tell, I'm, I'm totally stalling for time here. So Roseanne slipped me the harvest menu. So this is, this is not an actual, these aren't menu items. This is just a preview of what is to come. Okay. I thought you were gonna have me actually read menu items. I thought, <laughs> man, we're in trouble. We're in trouble if I'm reading a menu. Okay, so this is the harvest menu of the actual progress seminar itself. So as I mentioned, we're going to hear from Fiona today hopefully any moment now. And then we're going to take a break. Then we're going to have a panel discussion. Uh, it's the future of office in San Mateo County. Is it premature to call time of death? We're going to be talking about uh, a commercial office uh, space, what's happening with the economy. We've got Dr. Robert Bell, Managing Director of Peak Point Consultants. Uh, we also have Winsome Bowen, who is the head of regional transportation policy at Facebook. And as you know, uh, with this pandemic, so many people working from home, what's it going to be like when the economy recovers, when we're on the other side of the pandemic? Will we go to some kind of a hybrid model um, where folks are partially working from home and partially working at the office? What does that do uh, from a transportation infrastructure uh, standpoint? Uh, and also we'll be joined by uh, Mike Fertrell, the city manager of my hometown, uh, the city of South San Francisco, and he can talk a lot about what's happening with the biotechnology industry as somebody who lives there and drives by uh, the east of 101 on a uh, regular basis. Um, the cranes are there. Uh, South San Francisco is, is growing by leaps and bounds, even in the midst of uh, some of the economic headwinds we're facing. So the biotechnology industry uh, continues to be a strong sector. Uh, it's also, we're adjacent to SFO, which has had real issues, uh, of course, during the pandemic with, with air travel being severely limited. But we're going to get into all those kinds of issues about uh, where things stand from a, an economic standpoint in South City. And we also, and, and the county more broadly, we also have Lena Tutko. She is the senior research manager with Colliers International. And Lena could give us uh, the numbers and how we're looking with regard to uh, office. And Aaron Acknan, 
uh, formerly of the city of Redwood City, but now he's a principal with uh, the Good City Company. He's kind enough to give us his time uh, this morning to moderate that panel. Just to look forward to uh, next Friday, what we're going to be talking about next Friday. Again, we've got that uh, 945 start. Uh, we have an opening keynote, and we will be hearing from Dr. Shashank Joshi, uh, addressing mental health in our community. Uh, Dr. Joshi is a professor of psychiatry, pediatrics, and education with Stanford University School of Medicine and Graduate School of Education. And then, um, uh, similar to today, we will... Uh, transition into a panel discussion entitled San Mateo County Strong Emergency Response in a Time of Crisis. And uh, for those uh, electeds on the call, uh, you know that we've had this recurring weekly conference call uh, with uh, sort of the anchorman of our county, Mike Callagy, walking us through all of the uh, issues with COVID and the county's impressive response to this public health emergency. But um, as somebody who's been in public life for 25 years now, it's actually been an extraordinary time of collaboration among all these elected officials. I think we get, I, I think it's something like 150, 175 um, uh, electeds. Uh, we've got public safety personnel who joined us, uh, county personnel, public health folks. So it's been an extraordinary, the technology has actually provided an extraordinary opportunity for us to all, uh, talk about uh, all of these issues in that uh, kind of a setting. But I've never seen this kind of communication and collaboration among all the electeds. Uh, and without Mike Callagy, none of this happened. So Mike comes out of the public safety arena. I think he was uh, uh, ideally suited to deal with the public health challenges that that we have uh, faced in this county. He's going to be participating in that panel on emergency response. And our own Roseanne Faust, of course, will be there. And Louise Rogers, the chief of the San Mateo County Health System, um, who's really been on the front line of dealing with just an extraordinary public health uh, uh, crisis uh, confronting uh, this county, this state, this country and this world. That'll be moderated by Carol Grimm, uh, one of our co-chairs of the Progress Seminar. So look forward to that. And then the closing session will be Friday, November 20th. Uh, we will have an uh, opening keynote. Uh, we've got uh, Josh Becker. We'll be hearing from Josh Becker, uh, who will be our colleague in the California State Senate. Congratulations, Josh, on your victory. Uh, San Mateo County will be well served with Josh uh, in that role. And then we will hear, uh, we will have a fireside chat. I'm really excited about this opportunity. I get to interview Steve Herman. He's the White House Bureau Chief with the Voice of America. So, um, Talk about a lot to uh, get into with this presidential election, uh, America's standing in the world, and all those kinds of things. So I'm, I'm excited about that um, on Friday, November 20th. So I've been slipped a note. We're, we're still waiting for Fiona. She'll be on uh, in just a minute. But we have a uh, video uh, from one of our sponsors, Facebook, and I think we have the ability to roll that. Let's go Hi, ahead and everyone. roll that. I'm Ashley Quintana, Public Policy Manager at Facebook, and I'm so thrilled to welcome you all to the 51st Progress Seminar. Thank you to Redwood City, San Mateo County, Chamber of Commerce for making this event possible. Facebook is proud to be the signature sponsor of this year's event. And even though it's not in person, near the beach or vineyards as many of us wish it was, it's truly great to have the opportunity to still get together and participate in the important conversations that happen at Progress. And what a year it has been. Pivot was truly the theme for us throughout these past few months. I'm sure many of you would say the same, but how amazing it has been to see our communities come together and support each other. At Facebook, our work is grounded in our mission to build community by responding directly to community needs. With the pandemic, it truly put many of our neighbors at risk of not being able to afford food for themselves or their families. Through our partners with community organizations, we provided healthy food, produce, and funding, and piloted a program to purchase meals from local restaurants to distribute to those in need. And as many of you may have seen, our local smallest businesses have been struggling during these times. We offered over 50 million in flexible cash grants and advertising credits to help Bay Area businesses with their current critical needs that they may have. 
Our region's housing crisis was only made worse by COVID-19. We provided emergency homelessness funding to help people without permanent housing safely shelter in place. With the pivot to distance learning, we also saw an opportunity to help students by providing hotspots and other tech essentials. Of course, with the greater need for masks and gloves, we distributed critical protective equipment to local hospitals and community organizations on the front lines of fighting this pandemic. And finally, talk about quickly pivoting. We were able to support local nonprofits specifically engaged in COVID-19 relief initiatives through the Facebook Local Community Fund. We know work such as this will continue thanks to the efforts of the people like you here at Progress. It's because of our long-standing partnerships and collaboration with many of you that our community efforts continue to be impactful. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much. In the spirit of building community and bringing people closer together, which is something that Progress has done so wonderfully over the years, I hope you all immerse yourself in the upcoming discussion and leave today feeling motivated and optimistic by our community's resilience and spirit of collaboration. So like many of you who are wearing your blazer on top and pajama bottoms underneath, I wish you a comfy and happy progress. All right, thank you, Ashley and Facebook. And let me formally welcome uh, all of our attendees. We appreciate you for taking the time to join us for this virtual progress seminar. And now we've been joined by a very special guest. Those of you uh, that have attended previous progress seminars know that we strive to bring you speakers and topics that are thought provoking and timely. We hope that we have met that standard with the series that we are starting today. And as is our custom, we're kicking off the progress seminar this morning with a keynote presentation and are very, very fortunate to be joined by our California State Treasurer, Fiona Ma. She is a familiar face uh, to those of us on the peninsula. Fiona, it is wonderful to see you. And while you can read her full biography in the program, I wanted to just briefly highlight uh, some of her uh, career points. Fiona is a CPA, which I imagine is very helpful uh, for the state treasurer of a state like California. She was employed first at Ernst & Young. Then she started her own small business here in California. She, she worked as an aide for then state Senator John Burton at the state building in San Francisco. Little known fact, Fiona and I shared a floor uh, in that state building when I was working for Jackie Spear. Uh, so that's where I first got uh, to know uh, Fiona. She went on to be appointed uh, to the city and county of San Francisco Assessment Appeals Board. She was elected to the San Francisco Board of Supervisors uh, to the State Assembly, where she served as the Speaker Pro Tem of the Assembly, something else we uh, have in common. And most recently, she served on our State Board of Equalization before her statewide election as uh, California State Treasurer in 2018. With her local roots, private and public sector experience, and understanding of local government, she brings a very balanced perspective to statewide issues, and um, sh she may not uh, tell you this, but I know for a fact she's on the short list to be a future uh, governor or U.S. senator uh, in the state of California. And by the way, Gavin Newsom may actually have an appointment to the U.S. Senate as of this morning. Um, just throwing it out there. Uh, and as California confronts its most challenging state of the economy during uh, my tenure in the legislature, I am encouraged by Fiona's uh, steady leadership and the whole conversation as we move through this pandemic but deal with this recession is what do we do from an economic recovery standpoint and Fiona is going to be front and center uh, in that conversation so please join me in welcoming our state treasurer the honorable Fiona Ma. Fiona wonderful to see you thank you for doing this thank you thank you Kevin for having me and um a virtual hello to all the progress uh, seminar so attendees. I, Sorry, I we can't have... meet in person, but um, this will make do. And I think what many of us are used to over the last eight months. Uh, so as uh, Assembly Member Mullen uh, stated, I started my uh, professional career working as a CPA with Ernst & Winnie in the real estate tax group in San Francisco. Uh, stayed five years, got my master's in taxation, and then left at the age of 28 to start my own practice. 
And that was the first time I got involved in politics as the president of the Asian Business Association, um, trying to get more contracting opportunities for women and minority small businesses at the local, state, federal, and even through private sector contracts. Uh, so I started to understand the importance of small business and how difficult it is to run a small business. You know, many of our forefathers and mothers came to this country uh, not able to um, utilize the skills and the education that they learned in their former countries. And really the way to make uh, ends meet was to st start a small business, but it is really uh, confusing the laws and the uh, audits and the filings and the forms you have to fill out. Uh, and so that's where my passion uh, started is representing small businesses. And it still is a passion of, of mine still to this day. So, as the state treasurer, um, I continue to do what I do to do what I can to outreach to small businesses. If you look on my website, www.treasurer.ca.gov, I have two buttons. The first button is our official COVID-19 button where you can read all of the governor's executive orders and the different colors and uh, resources and websites. And then the second one is my COVID-19 resource guides, where my outreach team updates our guides for small business, seniors, nonprofits, individuals, food access, and tax relief. And we really encourage people to come to this website uh, so that you're not applying for some grant or loan program that has been expended. And that's what a lot of people do is they read about it, they apply and they never hear back. And then they're just waiting yet. There's no more money and nobody let you know that, you know, you're not eligible. So we also set up a dedicated email and that is ask Fiona at treasure.ca.gov for anyone who has any questions or wants us to follow up on their PPP, for example, or their unemployment insurance, or they just can't get through uh, to get their refund from the Franchise Tax Board. And that uh, email has been utilized quite extensively as we have been doing about you know 90 webinars uh, since uh, March 16th. Um, so it's been very, very uh, gratifying um, to be the state treasurer. Uh, this is my second year, and our first year was the first time uh, in a long time that I had a surplus, right? Um, many of us, like uh, Kevin knows, we have seen many uh, downturns. Uh, I personally, on the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, served during the dot-com bust and 9-11, then in the assembly, I served during the Great Recession. And now here we are again in this COVID-19 pandemic. So initially, the first year, we were doing great. Um, our numbers uh, were, we were, we were seeing surpluses in all of our uh, major revenue sectors, our income taxes, our corporate tax, our sales taxes. Uh, the two, uh, two of the credit rating agencies actually upgraded us last fall because of number one, the rainy day fund that Jerry Brown, um, thankfully, uh, put aside for us uh, and through voter initiative. And then the fact that we were passing on time budgets, uh, that was also very appealing to the credit rating agencies. And so we were looking pretty good. Um, we were selling bonds last year, great results, great rates. Uh, money was coming in. Um, you know, we were able in the legislature, as, as many um, folks there, they were able to pass many bills that normally wouldn't uh, get passed. And then the pandemic hit this year. And all of a sudden, our $26 billion deficit turned into a $54 billion, I'm sorry, $26 billion surplus uh, in January turned into a $54 billion deficit uh, by the end of June, the end of our fiscal year. Meanwhile, we have been waiting anxiously uh, for our stimulus money. Um, we did pretty good in our first three stimulus packages, and this last one that passed the House did not pass the Senate. Um, has created a lot of angst, not only for the state, but I know a lot of local government agencies. Emily Beach uh, texted me earlier this morning and I asked her what she wanted 
me to talk about. And she said, basically, um, you know, what our fiscal outlook was going to look like, especially, you know, to the local governments. And I will talk about that in a little bit. Um, <clears throat> but before I do, I just want to give an overview of uh, my treasurer's office. Uh, I am your state banker and every revenue, interest, fine, penalty, fee comes into my office, totaling about $2.6 trillion every year. I invest any of the state's idle money, as well as invest for about 22 local government units. So most of the uh, cities uh, and counties here in the Bay Area, I invest your money in short-term investments, and that portfolio is about $103 billion. And then I issue bonds, uh, large infrastructure bonds, revenue bonds, as well as the bonds for the UC system and the CSU system. And even during this pandemic, we were the first state in the nation to go back into the market in April. And we have been doing really, really well um, ever since. I think this last month, I was able to sell five bonds that were oversubscribed. So the good news is that investors still have a lot of confidence in California and what we are doing here. Um, I also chair 16 different boards and committees. So anything that has to do with affordable housing, hospitals, schools, uh, advanced manufacturing, public transportation, uh, green energy, um, those are under my jurisdiction. I also chair three different uh, savings boards, uh, Scholarshare 529, um, has been a long-standing program to encourage uh, folks to save for a child's college savings. And we just launched a new website, and that is called College Countdown. So the College Countdown uh, just launched last week, and it is kind of like a virtual counselor for parents who have a junior or a senior in high school. And it basically gives a step-by-step -step timeline and resources uh, that you should be thinking about as you're preparing your child for college. We also have a parent advisory council, uh, parents who saved uh, money using the Scholarship 529 and now have kids in college that is available to answer any questions that you may all have. Uh, second new program is CalABLE. For those people who are diagnosed with a disability uh, before the age of 26, you can now save up to $15,000 in that person's name without jeopardizing any of the benefits. The limit before was $2,000 in someone's name. And so now it is creating a lot more financial security for folks with disabilities. We are working very hard in Congress to increase onset age for disability to 46 years old, because we know that some people do get injured later on or have a disability later on in their lifetime. And then the third one that I think is, um, is uh, very appealing to many small business owners is our CalSavers program. And that was championed by Senator Kevin DeLeon, uh, signed by Jerry Brown before he left, that provides a retirement savings plan for individual employees who don't have access to an, an employer plan. We estimate that there are about 7.5 million workers who don't have a retirement plan at work, and 50% of those are Latinos. So it really is uh, kind of a, a game changer for not only the individuals who will be able and hopefully are going to be able to save uh, for their retirement or a rainy day. But for those employers, many of them small business owners who uh, can't afford to run a pension plan for fiscal or um, legal liabilities. And so you basically, if you're a small business owner, um, you basically sign your employees up with us. You upload uh, your employees' um, information, and then that account stays with that individual employee, and the small business owner has no other obligation uh, legally or fiscally um, with these accounts, and we manage it uh, professionally with our CalSavers uh, board and executive director, Katie Selinsky. And so we just passed our first deadline for those 
employers with 100 or more employees. The first deadline was September 30th of this year. And then next year will be uh, the deadline for those with 50 employees or more. And then the third year will be those with five employees or more. And even if you are a gig worker or an independent contractor, you can also uh, sign up and have your account managed uh, by our CalSAVERS um, folks. Um, I know affordable housing has been a top issue. I know I've gotten calls from Assemblymember Mullen about certain projects that are happening in your area. I also chair TCAC and SIDLAC. That is the Tax Credit Allocation Committee, as well as the Tax uh, CIDLAC, the California Debt Limit Allocation Committee. So we allocate the 9 and the 4% affordable housing bonds, uh, tax credits, and then also the, uh, the bonds. And this year, because of Gavin Newsom, uh, last year he gave us $500 million in uh, state tax credits. He gave us another $500 million in this fiscal year. Uh, that has made the bonds extremely competitive. Uh, it hasn't been competitive over the last many, many decades. And so we have done a lot to reform our regs, uh, make sure that we are more transparent uh, with our stakeholders. Um, I did 15 listening tours when I first got elected around the state just to uh, understand and hear from different regions. Sorry, my dog is barking. Um, um, and since then, you know, we created a 35 or maybe it's like 40 person working group right now of stakeholders who work directly in the industry. And they have been instrumental in helping us craft our regulations um, moving forward uh, for both TCAC and SIDLAC. And then thanks to Congressman Mike Thompson, he got us a billion dollars in uh, 9% uh, tax credits for disaster areas. Uh, there are 13 major areas that were devastated by the fires in 2017 and 2018. And Grisman Thompson uh, wanted to help rebuild housing in those 13 uh, counties. And so we thought we were going to have three rounds of uh, housing allocations and lo and behold, we were oversubscribed 2.5 times in our first round. And so we have pretty much uh, given out all the credits this year. And uh, you should see a lot of different housing projects uh, being built in your communities, whether they are multifamily, seniors, disabled, uh, veterans. Um, and so it's really, really exciting that, uh, you know, government, Governor Gavin Newsom uh, set a goal of 3.5 million homes by 2025. And for those of us in the housing space, we know that is an ambitious goal, but at least he has set a high bar and all of us are working diligently uh, together, not only as government agencies, but also working collaboratively with our stakeholders to try to get as much housing built the most efficiently uh, as possible. And of course, um, having a geographic uh, distribution so that everybody has access to affordable housing around the state. Um, I also have a couple of programs um, that may interest uh, you um, in our area. I have a sales tax exemption program under our CAFTA program, our California Alternative Transportation and uh, Energy Financing Authority. And these sales tax exemption basically is available for those companies that buy expensive equipment uh, and they want to waive their sales taxes, which could be significant millions of dollars and really could be a game changer for uh, many of the uh, companies that are seeking to stay here. So we have um, money or this program is available for recycling uh, companies and composters. Um, advanced manufacturing, uh, those companies that are using less resources, less energy, water, uh, or producing less pollutants or waste, or advanced transportation, uh, those that are identified by our authority as ener energy commercially uh, leveraging commercially competitive transportation related technologies like electric cars or aircraft or batteries used for zero emissions. And so this program is also uh, 
oversubscribed. And so we're very happy that people um, know about the sales tax exemption program. I also sit on the Cal Competes uh, board, which awards uh, income tax uh, exemptions for those companies that are committed uh, to hiring a certain number of people uh, in various industries. And we had a meeting yesterday and we were again oversubscribed. So the good news is a lot of companies want to stay here in California. They want to expand here, uh, but we need to do what we can to make ourselves more competitive. And all of you know, we're always hearing uh, threats of, you know, different governors like from Texas trying to lure away our businesses. Um, we know that other states just right around us um, are also trying to uh, lure our uh, businesses or trying to get them to expand in their states. And so um, being competitive is top of mind. And I kind of consider myself the business ambassador for the state. Uh, the governor is extremely busy with um, other issues, but since I have many of the tools in my toolbox and I sit on the boards that allocates bonds and money, um, loans and grants, uh, I have a pretty good picture of what we can or can't do. And I go around the state um, offering our assistance because there's a lot of projects that we know that just don't pencil and have been waiting for that extra assistance. So I can continue to talk about more um, topics, but I think I will just open it up for questions and answers since it is uh, 1030 and I want to leave enough time for people to ask questions. So, Kevin? Fantastic. Fantastic, Fiona. I just want to make sure uh, my audio is live here. Excellent. Thank you so much, Fiona. You talked about uh, many, many topics that, that I want to get to. I want to remind our uh, viewers that you can type your questions in for Fiona into the Zoom webinar chat, and Maggie is going to be monitoring the chat, and we'll lob some questions in uh, that we get. And before we're done here, Fiona, I want to make sure we get a Nika Ma cameo. Okay, hold I on. Uh, let's let, yeah, let's just get it done right now. We got to see. All right, here we All go. All right, there we go. Our, suddenly, the ratings are spiking. Just so you know. There we go. There we go. <laughs> I know, and and you know sometimes when things are tough, I just post uh, post on yeah. you know on my dog. Oh, yeah, that's that's, that's my that's my go to. My dog, my twins, <laughs> just you know, I get way more likes for them than anything I do politically. Uh, uh, exactly. <laughs> but uh, so you talked uh, you talked about housing, and I had uh, frankly I, I sort of <clears throat> uh, neglected. To, to mention that on your intro, just the role that the treasurer's office could have on affordable housing and tax credits. Um, I'm just struck, you know, this is a huge issue. It's a, it's a perennial issue at the Progress Seminar is, you know, how do we build more affordable housing in this county? How do we deal with the jobs, housing imbalance? Um, you know, we had high hopes this year in the legislature about doing something big on housing. Turns out it was supposed to be the year of production and um, I don't want to hang it all on COVID, but I think I underestimated the importance of being together in that capital, working through these very difficult issues and negotiating. Uh, and we essentially, the clock ran out on us and we just did not do anything to the scale of the problem. You know, we had certainly some housing bills become law, but how do we actually jumpstart this in a major way to get anywhere close to the 3.5 million homes that Gavin Newsom is talking about? Certainly, you have CEQA as an issue, um, but just kind of like big picture, and I know it's like one of these issues that like 25, 30 different things need to happen for us to move that needle, but what are some of like the biggest things that we could do to come anywhere close to meeting our jobs, housing imbalance, kind of like big picture? Where should we be focusing our, our energies? Yeah, I, I think um, once the redevelopment agencies were uh, dissolved, that really slowed us down because a lot of the housing experts uh, worked in those agencies. So they knew how to fill out the forms. Um, they knew what the deadlines were. They kept track with any uh, new regulations um, at the federal level. And then once they were dissolved, all of a sudden, you know, the housing experts were 
gone, so to speak. And then everyone was left to try to figure out how to navigate the system and trying to apply either on our TCAC side or our SIDLAC side. It's not for everyone. You know, even if you want to be an affordable housing developer and you're like, hey, how do I do it? I can't even really explain it to you. You probably have to hire a consultant or team up with someone who has been doing this because it is really, really complicated. But what we have done at the state level is we have tried to streamline our processes. So for example, CalHFA, uh, California Housing Finance Agency, led by Tia Patterson, uh, Tia Boatman Patterson, uh, we um, combined and did uh, one application. This is the first time and people have complained because we have four essential agencies that deal with housing uh, for different reasons. And people say, why is that? And I always say, you know what? Because of checks and balances, right? Because sometimes, you know, it depends who the governor is, uh, depends who's in the legislature, depends who the constitutional officers are. It's always good to just have a check and balancing so that power uh, for certain things like housing is not just, um, you know, under one person and, if housing is not that governor's mandate, well, then housing is never going to be built without any sort of pressure or levers uh, from outside um, or other parties. Um, so I would say government is trying to streamline. And even in my office, uh, things that don't make sense, you know, for the developers, they say, you know, why do we have to file these extra reports? Why do we have to submit, you know, documents to you and then also, you know, our our housing and community development and college of a can't you guys just all combine and have one application where we submit one set of documents and you guys can all pull and so we are working on those type of processes i would say at the local level the local level needs to do the same thing right because if developers cannot get permits timely right if you don't have good processes to streamline. There's always going to be the NIMBYs. Um, you know, how many times can they appeal a project, for example? Uh, the more opportunities to slow down housing at the local level obviously slows down the applications that come to state level. I just have to tell you, the pipeline is amazing. There's like $10 billion worth of housing projects, and we only have $4 billion worth of bond cap every year. So as you can see, uh, there's a lot of um, you know demand out there. We are also lobbying the federal government to give us more bond cap or allow us to use other states that don't use all of their affordable housing tax credits and bonds. We also want to increase the level so that we can do more. Um, so we are actively doing what we can, but local government also, I served at the local government and I know depending on who the governor is, I mean, I mean sorry, the mayor is or the city administrator, or um, the general manager really depends on how quickly things get out, right? Applications, permits, um, hearings, you know, everything needs to be efficient at the local level so you can get it to our level. And we're trying to be as efficient as we can at the state level. Great, Fiona. So a, a quick shout out from Charles Stone from the city of Belmont. This is not so much a question as a huge shout out and thank you as chair of Seedlack. Fiona was hugely helpful in getting Belmont's Firehouse Square, uh, all affordable housing project across the finish line. She is a true housing champion. Uh, Wayne Lee from the city of Millbrae, what monies will be made available for cities and municipalities as grants or loans to make up COVID-related economic impacts? And I think this speaks to the broader question of can we count on any federal relief if we have a change of administration? Because much of this is federal money that's going to route through the state and, and hopefully get uh, maybe directly to localities. Um, just kind of the, the overall economic relief picture. And I would say it's probably in flux depending on who uh, is in charge and what the U.S. Senate right. looks like because this is much uh, a federal question than anything. But there's also some things we could do on the state level uh, as well. So just economic impacts for, for city folks. Yeah, I mean, you know, for uh, city elected officials, obviously work through your assembly member and senator in terms of what you see are the needs. Um, you know, the 
initial stimulus packages that came down. We got $9.2 billion uh, in the second package. Uh, some of it went down to the states. Um, and then some of the larger cities and counties were able to apply directly to the federal government. But clearly it is not enough. And we are all worried. We're, we're all waiting for more money out of this last HEROES Act, as well as the infrastructure package that passed the House. Um, you know, we're not sure, uh, given what's happening, you know, whether we're going to get an agreement out of the Senate. It doesn't look like, um, you know, the Senate is going to uh, flip to Democrats. And so we're going to continue to have uh, these discussions and it's going to be. And we know that local governments are dependent. Right. I served on the board of supervisors. We have to balance every year. We cannot borrow or print money. And so we are really um you know, beholden to what is happening at the state and the federal level. I know that uh, some of the local jurisdictions um, have been applying or issuing pension obligation bonds uh, to, you know, to help with their uh, pension uh, needs, uh, unfunded liabilities moving forward um, while you're waiting. But there are certain jurisdictions around the state I know that are just completely hurting because they are so dependent on tourism dollars. And so continue to work with your elected officials with, you know, visit California. I know that Carolyn is very active in working with all the major attractions and tourist uh, destination sites. And of course, you know, the governor, right? The governor is ultimately the one who holds the, the pocketbook. Uh, and so to the extent that you all find that there is some, you know, missing gap. You know, I know bar owners, for example, you know, are having a hard time. They can't open up yet. They still have to, you know, pay their property taxes, their insurance, their mortgage. Uh, like, what are we going to do for them? You know, are we going to pay them to stay closed or are we going to allow them an option uh, so that they can open up? And you know, that obviously the quicker we open up, the better we are going to be. And I always say, I now know why we are the fifth largest economy is because the people of California are creative, they're entrepreneurial, and they want to work. They don't want to depend on a handout. They want to work, but they can't work unless we start opening up. So I'm hoping we open up sooner than later. So, Fiona, we have a question from Chantel Sosa. You mentioned bonds for the UCs and CSUs. Any information on the community colleges or K-12? So maybe if you could just talk a little bit about bonding capacity and the role of the treasurer's office uh, when it comes to education uh, bonds and community college and K-12. All right. So um, I also chair the California School Financing Authority, which uh, traditionally has really um, provided funding for new construction or renovations for public charter schools. I asked my committee to do a little bit more and see what we can do in terms of housing on community college sites. Um, I read articles, as you probably did, that so many of our community college students are living out of their cars, for example, or even homeless. Um, and so why aren't we providing housing on those properties that have land? And a lot of the community college uh, sites do have land. So we are doing our first deal with the Santa Rosa Community College to provide uh, build help build student housing. And we're hoping uh, that we will be able to build more um, housing on different community college sites. This is an area where it has been riskier for the private sector. And I always tell people, you know, business and government is not the same, right? Um, normally businesses, when they're doing well, uh, they're paying people's health and retirement. And then when they're not doing well, they lay people off. And then that's where government has to step in as the safety net. But government also has the ability to uh, backfill as we do in some of our small business loans, for example, uh, provide a loan loss reserve or a loan guarantee so that banks will lend to riskier clients and riskier projects such as building uh, student housing or teacher housing on community college sites. So we're doing that. Um, we are also providing a funding mechanism, kind of a loan program for K through 12 schools right now. 
since they also don't have the ability to borrow or print money, they are also dependent on 50% of the general fund that comes to the state of California. And as our funds uh, decrease, then their funding also decreases. And so we are providing a kind of a loan uh, pool for them. And we've got, you know, a couple hundred uh, schools that have participated or participating in our program. But we are open uh, and we can, um, you know, accommodate more school sites uh, to help you during this time. Yeah. <clears throat> Pardon me, Laura Palmer Lohan from the city of San Carlos asked about uh, the RENA numbers and the 3.5 million homes. We've, we've touched on that issue, but she's specifically asking about any financial incentives for cities uh, to build housing. And, you know, this is an issue that goes, it, it goes back to our time as AIDS uh, in, the, in the 90s, yeah. which is uh, state local finance and how does it pay for cities to build housing? So there are some kind of global, like constitutional fixes but is there anything uh, more immediate uh, in terms of like financial incentives for cities to build how affordable housing? Yeah, I mean, I, I always uh, believe, you know, there's two ways to incentivize folks, a uh, carrot and a stick. I prefer to use the carrot approach. Uh, and I do think if you incentivize uh, people to, um, you know, meet their arena numbers, I mean, they're just goals at the time. I sat on a bag. Many of you know, we talk about these numbers and not hardly anybody actually reaches those numbers, you know, a couple jurisdictions, but a lot of times it's because it's difficult to build. There's, uh, you know, NIMBYs, um, you know, local governments um, aren't, you know, effective or, or um, you know, efficient enough. Uh, and so then the other one is the stick where you saw Governor Newsom sue certain cities because they refused to even look at their arena numbers or even attempt to try to build any type of housing. Uh, so those are the two approaches right now. And housing, uh, some member Mullen knows, you know, I know there's been so many bills going through the legislature trying to increase housing, housing production around certain locations, make it, you know, efficient, effective. And it's not always easy because uh, change is always difficult. So I would just say we need to focus on arena numbers. Uh, we talk about it in our housing agencies. Uh, we just underwent an audit with the state auditor, and that was one of her questions is, are you looking at the arena numbers? And we said yes. And she said, are you aligning your housing based on the arena numbers? And we don't do that. Uh, as a policy because we're really dependent on the developers and those jurisdictions that really want that type of housing to go in. So even though you may want to build in, let's say, Newport Coast, if they don't want housing, then the developers know that they're never going to get their permits through. They're not going to go there. So they're going to go to places where um, they're going to it's going to be easier for them to build in those jurisdictions. So that's kind of a dilemma we have. And, you know, we can't force local jurisdictions to meet their arena numbers. I mean, there's a lot of pressure when we write about it and we audit and we talk about it, but ultimately there is no real um, stick except if you're going to sue a jurisdiction for not even trying. Yeah. So newly reelected Millbury Councilwoman Gina Pappen, also a representative on MTC, is asking about the 27 transit agencies in the Bay Area and potential for consolidation now that we have ridership uh, down in the pandemic and the recession. This is an old issue uh, uh, as well, but just in terms of, um, you know, what kinds of tough choices are we going to have to make in terms of just government services in a sort of restructured economic situation where we just don't have the resources that we used to? Is it federal government or bust uh, on in terms of this kind of assistance that we need to keep these transit agencies afloat? Yeah, I, I think one of the early stimulus packages was for uh, certain transit agencies. Obviously, it's not enough. Um, I think a change in the administration in the White House, we are going to see more money uh, for transportation. As you know, there was this uh, kind of um, very contentious relationship 
uh, between the White House and the state of California over the past four years. Uh, and so it's been really difficult. I, When I got elected to the state assembly in 2006, uh, one of the um, issues that I took on was to keep the high-speed rail initiative on the ballot. We were building a new trans base station and we wanted to know is high-speed rail going to pass or not? If it is, we need to build a station that accommodates it. If it's not, then we will uh, build accordingly. And so even in the midst of the Great Recession, November 2008, Proposition 1A uh, for the High-Speed Rail Authority passed cl with close to 53% of the vote. And I pretty much went to all the university campuses along the potential high-speed rail route and got them to you know, sign on and sign up and, and lobby to pass it. And I really do think it was the young people that passed high-speed rail. So they get it. Uh, we all get it. Um, and I also have spearheaded uh, the private project, Brightline, that will go from Victorville to Las Vegas. And so that has been an 18-month project that would sell private activity bonds to the private market. Unfortunately, because of all the chaos that's happening right now and the lack of liquidity in the market, they weren't able to sell the bonds and they're going to try again next year. But my hope is once they get up and running from Victorville, they will go to Palmdale, they will go to Bakersfield and link into our high-speed rail network. Uh, they will also go to Rancho Cucamonga, uh, where um, the LA Metro goes out to Rancho Cucamonga, and then they could catch the train out to Vegas. But it's not only a train, it's also an economic development driver in the high desert. The high desert is one of the poorest uh, communities, counties. They still never even recovered after the Great Recession. And so that would also kickstart housing and jobs and economic development out in the high desert region. I am focused on public transportation. I love riding the trains. I've ridden a lot of high speed trains around the world. Uh, it baffles me that we still you know, sit in the car or that trains don't go to the destination we want and therefore it's not convenient for us to take a train and everyone gets in their cars, but we have to do better, especially you know, with the amount of congestion, our population increasing, and of course, our commitment to combating climate change. So uh, I'm committed to it. Thank you, Gina, for all of your service. Um, and hopefully with the new administration, we will be able to get more money into a new transportation funding bill. We will all keep our fingers crossed there. So a reminder to post your questions in the Q&A. I think I said chat before. It's actually the Q&A section. But I'm not sure we're going to have time to get to all the questions. But uh, a question that came in a while back from Chris Hunter. How do you feel about Elon Musk's threat to take Tesla out of California? And what do we do with those kinds of situations where you have a big time business um, uh, you know, threatening to leave? What kind of action plan do we have to try to keep those companies? But what is the push pull there like when it comes to um, business retention, especially a big employer like Tesla? Yeah. So um, as an accountant, uh, I am very focused on our high quality jobs. Uh, Ninety percent of our general fund is dependent on income taxes, corporate taxes and sales taxes. So keeping those high quality jobs here uh, is very, very important. And, you know, at top of mind. So I'm a big fan of Elon Musk. I have been to his Tesla site in Fremont. I've been to his battery site in Reno. I've been down to his boring company and rode uh, the uh, Tesla through the underground tunnel. I'm going to be going to his other, uh, um, what is it, Hyperloop um, coming up. So I'm a big fan and he loves California. You know, I talked to him on the phone. He appreciates all the help that we give him. They are one of our major applicants for our sales tax exemption program, for example, as well as our Cal Competes program. Uh, and so he is important to California and he wants to stay here in California. Now, he was upset when he wasn't able to open the Fremont plant uh, back during, you know, I guess it was, let's see, maybe July, June or July, when other 
uh, electric vehicle companies were open across the United States and around the world, he felt like that was clearly a disadvantage for um, for Tesla here in California, especially if they are the only major electric vehicle manufacturer here in the state of California. And so you can rightly say why he was upset. Like, if you want us to be here, why aren't you supporting us? So I did text Gavin and I said, Gavin, can you please call Elon Musk? You know, he's upset. And that's when he said he's going to move to uh, Texas. But Gavin did call him and, and, you know, worked things through, allowed them to open uh, in their phasing. Uh, and so he is going to stay, but he is going to manufacture his new monster truck. I went to that opening as well um, in Austin, Texas, you know, just because there's not enough space here in California um, for him to do it. And he probably wants to diversify a little bit. And, you know, Austin does have a lot of qualified talent uh, for the type of uh, business that he has over there. So, I think all is good with Elon, but you can call him and ask him, but I think we're, we're good again. And <clears throat> Paul Kripka uh, touches on the $54 billion uh, deficit. You, you've talked a little bit about that. We are hopeful that we will get some uh, federal assistance, but very much uh, up in the air. And what's also up in the air, Fiona, is just the economic trajectory, right? We've seen um, some tax receipts actually um, rebound a little bit, um, and there are some suggestions that I've heard, I've heard differing opinions that we've got a very, uh, basically a short recession on our hands that we will rebound very quickly. I've also heard this is going to be a slog for like three years. I mean, just big picture, do you have a sense um, what kind of a recovery we can hope for or expect? Uh, asking you to look into your crystal ball from seeing the ups and downs over the years, but we've never seen anything like quite like this, have we? Yeah, so uh, part of my job as a treasurer is that I cannot speak to the market. Uh, there are certain blackout periods where we are in the market selling bonds and we make certain uh, disclosures uh, to the market in our bond documents and therefore I cannot speak outside of what we have submitted. The governor has said in his budget, uh, the Department of Finance in their projections, uh, the controller's office in their uh, projections as well. So I cannot give you a... Um, you know, a, a, a magic ball type of projection because I would be at risk of speaking to the market because if I say something that is contradictory to what everyone else is saying, I could get in a lot of trouble with the SEC. So that's why I have been very quiet, unusually quiet. As you know, elected officials were always out there and pounding and making statements and getting involved in uh, state and local initiatives. I've had to like be a little bit like quiet, uh, even though the president can tweet every day and move the market every single day, but not do that as my real estate treasurer. Uh, so I would just say, um, you know, you need to um, ask the governor uh, perhaps what he thinks um, is going to be the timing of our recession or visit California. For example, Carolyn has numbers uh, that she is also, um, you know, making public uh, to um you know, in terms of, you know, how long this is going to last. But, you know, right now, the governor, I think, has said perhaps the next three or four years. So, <clears throat> Fiona, we are running short on time. And we don't want to get you in trouble with the SEC, so don't, we're not going to go there you. today. Um, and we don't have enough time to get to these questions. Just very quickly, uh, Ed Evans with our Carpenters talked about the importance of the apprenticeship programs. And, yes. uh tying in skilled and trained construction workers on affordable housing projects. Uh, we've got a comment uh, from Nori Jabba about uh, some of the uh, uh, compliance process efficiencies um, around COVID, like DocuSign, for example. Will some of these uh, innovations really continue uh, after the COVID nightmare uh, uh, passes? So I, we don't quite have time to get into that, but just want to make you aware of that. 
And uh, another question about landlords and, um, you know, uh, struggling landlords who uh, rely on the rent. Uh, we also, of course, have uh, renters struggling to uh, stay in their apartments. And the legislature has done some work on, uh, frankly, an imperfect solution to help renters stay uh, in their apartments. Um, but I wanted to, and we've got just a couple minutes here, I wanted to just get your reaction, I have to, on the national election but also the state election, um, I was a little uh, candidly underwhelmed at uh, some of the uh, uh, results uh, with our state propositions. Uh, turnout was projected to be incredible because it's a pres presidential year and there's a lot of energy, political energy out there. Um, certainly, I, I think you saw that nationally, but uh, Democrats were hoping for like a really uh, historic kind of a turnout across the country. And I don't know that we're gonna see that and I don't think we're going to see that in California. California, but just wanted to take your political temperature on uh, just reactions to some of the results with propositions, for example. Well, I, I think everybody is struggling at this moment. Uh, they're anxious, uh, they're worried, and people voted that way on the propositions. Um, so it just, you know, I think if times were like last year, I think many of them probably would have passed, right? When people are happy, they don't mind paying their taxes. When they're not making money, well, taxes, tax increases, bonds, um, they're very, very sensitive to all that. So I think we saw that in the electorate. Um, you know, we, well, Kevin, I mean, I think you, you're following the legislature a little bit more closely. I don't know whether we had a lot of changes in the assembly, per se. No, the assembly is <clears throat> pretty much status quo. We're going to have 60 Democrats. The state Senate is going to pick up a couple. It is interesting that there are a couple of Democratic U.S. House seats that Democrats picked up in 18 that they might lose in 20. Um, some of that might be a function of the turnout was really incredible for a, for a midterm election in 2018. Democrats picked up some seats that, frankly, I don't think they expected to even right. pick up. Uh, so there's a little right. bit of a, a and there, there was also a sense, I think, that Joe Biden was going to win California even with the energy, and there's a lot of anti-Trump energy on the progressive side. It's just a reminder, though, that California is, frankly, a little more moderate than people realize. They put it in the blue column, but it's a diverse state politically, economically, geographically, uh, ethnically. And, uh, you know, California is a complex political equation uh, that people need to <laughs> figure out. But uh, one, one final question before we let you go. Somebody said, any advice that you would give to your younger self? Back when you were, uh, we were AIDS in the state building, what would you tell yourself? Uh, what advice would you give your younger self about uh, your success that you've been able to attain uh, in, both in business and in, and in politics? Any practical advice? Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I would say um, keep your word. You know, your word is your bonds and people will remember. And, and Kevin knows, especially in Sacramento, uh, if you've said you're going to be with them and then last minute you flip on the floor. Trust me, um, that that reputation gets out that you cannot really be trusted. Um, so I would say, you know, that is important. Um, you know, sometimes you have to go with your gut, even though it may not be popular. And that's what's hard about politics is even though you may believe in something or stand for or want to support or be against an initiative, even though uh, most of your party um, is a different way, it's that is really, really hard. And then number three, you know, make sure you protect your own uh, persona. Right. Social media for me has been a great equal equalizer because I wasn't in the major papers a lot because I wasn't controversial and I didn't want to throw stones. Um, and so to the general public that read, you know, the Chronicle, the San Jose Mercury News, for example, you know, you would think that, oh, Fiona Ma doesn't do anything. But now social media, you can tell and follow what I do every day. So protect your brand. Make sure you are communicating directly with your constituents uh, because during an election, you know, a lot of negative stuff comes. Many of them are lies or fake news. But the more that people know who you are, you know, whether you have twins or whether you have a dog, what you do on the weekends, you know, what, um, you know, groups that you support, you know, who you really are. I think that's going to be important for all of us, especially as we have seen you know, how the news and the media have really 
uh, changed and are not necessarily reporting balanced news these days. So um, that's what I would say is make sure you're communicating uh, as much as you can, hire good communications people, uh, stay on message, get ahead of the message and plan for what could uh, happen. Um, and I think that's probably what we've been doing a lot is just pre-planning what ifs and then how do we respond when certain situations happen. Well, Fiona, you're a superstar, and we are so grateful you took the time to be with us. And you've kicked this off in stellar fashion. Normally, we'd ask for a round of applause, uh, but we can't do that today uh, with the virtual approach here. But thank you so much, Fiona, and good luck to you in the future, and we will all, all be watching. And for our attendees, we're taking a break. We'll reconvene at 1130 for our first panel, so we'll see you in a little bit. Thanks, Fiona. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Bye. Bye.